Good morning, I'm Tripp, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about ransomware, stalkerware, and is there such a thing it's ever going to be somebody putting the feet to the fire to ethical AI? This is the Insecurity Brief podcast. It features tech news and analysis throughout the world. This podcast is made possible through advertising and listeners like you. If you can't donate, please share this program. We depend on you. October 13th, Ravi Lakershman wrote a story about the White House hosting 30 other countries uh, to build a coalition to fight ransomware where globally because of this attack vector that has to do so much with state-sponsored attacks and using ransomware as a leverage in order to bring down companies. Now, there was some disinformation that we all heard about on this, um, on this ransomware attack that was on uh, an oil pipeline not so long ago that it got hit by the news. Um, and some other ransomware attacks that, and what that were not reported correctly, and or were just out and out fake. So I don't know exactly where this is going to lead, but what it is going to do is open up a con- a um, open up a, a channel of communication maybe to figure out and nab who is behind all this. What do you think there, honey? Um, well, I mean, so the list of countries that were in attendance of this thing were Australia, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, Czech Republic, Dominican Republic, Estonia, EU, France, Germany, India, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Japan, Kenya, Lithuania, Mexico, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nigeria, Poland, Republic of Korea, Romania, Singapore, South Africa, Sweden, Switzerland, Ukraine, UAE, UK, and the US, but not China or Russia. So I think that some of the attendees, it's a little curious because Czech Republic is really big with Bitcoin. You can live on Bitcoin in the Czech Republic, their entire uh, society is set up that you can live off Bitcoin. Sure. In Nigeria, Nigeria is known for having lots of scammers. And then, of course, not having China or Russia, well, you know. Or Iran. Not to point fingers, but <laughs> some of the ransomware probably is coming from there. So if they don't have them included, um, you know, these problem areas, they're still going to be originating from these problem How, areas. W- was there India and Pakistan in there? No. Yeah, because there are a lot of the IT. Well, India was, but it, not Pakistan. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense because they, it, 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 the way that things get distributed, I mean, the attack vectors. How about Egypt? Well, Egypt doesn't have a, it has other issues right now, so... I don't know that they, they no, would. Um, nowhere else from the Middle East, really, except for the UAE, was included. But um, I, I mean, didn't see it, Greece in there either. No. Yeah. And but the, it said the European Union. So Greece is in the European Union, right? Yeah. You know, the whole thing about all of the ransomware stuff is. This is giving a blind, uh, it's soiling the name of encryption and making people nervous about encryption. And, um, you know, the actors that are out there, this is mostly, I I believe a lot of it is mostly state-sponsored stuff anyway. The, The thing is the internet is becoming an attack vector and we are all on the front line that means that um it's not just a battlefield somewhere out uh, in the desert somewhere across the planet this attack is including us at home and our next story is actually going to talk about 
a lot closer to um, to home than uh, this does. So in their consortium, they said that they're hoping to that network resilience by adopting cyber hygiene best practices like strong passwords and using two-factor authentication, keeping offline data backups and keeping software up to date is going to prevent the ransomware attacks, is going to prevent the cyber attacks that are happening. Like Not, it, that doesn't have that's anything... That's just kind of silly, don't you think so? It has... That's their big plan? Yeah. They need to unplug the SCADA from the networks. Maybe right. hospitals and hospital machinery shouldn't be plugged into the internet. They think two factor is going to save them? I think that's a joke. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And, you know, the thing about the internet is different than the intranet. When you have a LAN on the inside connecting your business, there's nothing saying that it needs to go on the outside and that it doesn't right. need to have a connection point. The way that this stuff works is if you have a LAN on the inside and you have a curtain, in other words, a physical single point plug that keeps everything from the outside and the inside, you can set side-by-side -side monitors and buttons and switches now that you have two separate devices for outside and inside. And we need to adopt these not only just in... Um, in institutions where it's mission critical that the devices are up all the time, but we need to have multiple redundant systems. This stuff of all in one box, I think is more of an American idea. I believe it is because I see the people around me believing that they can, they need a bigger cell phone every year because they have too much data for the old one. That's a major selling point, seems to be adding space to your cell phone and updating the camera beyond the use, uh, shooting 4K, really. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's part of the way that we upgrade ourselves. Having multiple devices is always better than having one single um, bread basket. Um, it, it just is. And I agree with you, honey. I really do. Two-factor, we just did a, a story about two-factor getting broken and um, all the text messages in the world uh, already got pilfered. And by the way, there's another, this is an ongoing movement in the telecommunication industry too. I mean, this, this stuff um, is getting closer and closer and being used in warlike methods. Absolutely. I mean, for, uh, further on in the article, they talked about how 400 million in 2020 was used, was collected or spent to ransomware attacks. And they talked about how, you know, the US Treasury Department previously sanctioned a Russian cryptocurrency exchange, Suez, Suex. Yeah. For for laundering money, but you know what? There's so, in the cryptocurrency inf ecosystem, there's so much money laundering. It is literally the black stock market's currency. Sure. So unless you're going to stop crime tomorrow, you're not going to stop Bitcoin tomorrow. And Russia and China are so have well, really China. China got so heavily vested and has backed Bitcoin so strongly. I, I mean, are they going to sanction all the Chinese cryptocurrency places? I mean, they, they'd have to sanction like a whole sector of cryptocurrency and and only have cryptocurrency, what, in America like or in these countries or the Five Eyes or something? I, I don't know how they plan to make that work, but that is their task. Well, the, other, with that, the other side of it is with the current thing with the United States and it going, um, it, uh, it actually going, uh, dollars being worth less with inflation, this is going to push a lot of people to dump their, uh, dollars and go to Bitcoin because, um, Bitcoin isn't inflating, dollars are. In other words, dollars are becoming worth less 
each day and Bitcoin is staying pretty much the same. Even when Bitcoin loses money on the stock market of its value, it's still increased value than the dollar is actually going against it. So um, I'm just not sure how that's going to shake either. And I'm not, money is not like one of my fortes. I mean, that kind of stuff uh, I, I casually read. I don't get it all. Um, maybe I ought to get a money guy to talk about it. Anyway, uh, like and subscribe, guys. And uh, Like and subscribe. Zach Whittaker uh, from TechCrunch.com released an article. A massive stockware leak puts the phone data of thousands at risk. Call records, text messages, and location data are easily accessed. So this is a story about just another one of the stalkerware types of apps. If you don't know what stalkerware is, it's an app that is marketed for either child tracking, monitoring software, or tracking your spouse. But this, and it's a software that will track and monitor you. And that's all your phone calls, all your text messages, your GUI, your GUIP location, um, and your pictures, and pretty much just compromising your entire phone like an ownage. And it, uh, and it's screenshots or whatever are, or just data itself is reported back to the per the attacker who installed it or tricked you to install it or whatever. So what do you think, Trip? What do you well, have to say? Well, the, the, the whole thing was that there had to be some other piece. There's a question too. With Apple's updates and Microsoft updates and Google's updates, which inerted Pegasus, there needs to be some kind of a replacement for it. So that was a major function because the dark guys um explain the dark guys real quick okay we hear about the military industrial complex there's a separate part of that that are more spies for hire so there's these companies that are out there that you can pay them and they will install stalker software this isn't just some 13 year old hacker these are trained worked for d various governments and now work for these side companies so pegasus is one of these from uh, that israeli company but they're not the only one a lot of these companies use not only stalker software but the ss7 which you may or may not know it's in my blog you can look it up online. The SS7 is sitting wide open. So when people talk about this trove of data, I'm not sure that the stalkerware is not just a red herring because you can get all the text messages, you can listen to the calls, you can get the geodata directly from the SS7, and you can also record it at the telco. So it doesn't really matter if you've got telco control and you've got SS7 control, you don't need to put any kind of crap on anybody's phone because you got them anyway. So what they're not saying in this article is that you have something no oh i thought you were gonna add something <laughs> you look like you wanted to add something <laughs> you know more about phones than i do <laughs> no i don't think so yeah you do um so you know the whole thing about this is I just wonder when I read this kind of stuff if these um, if it's just a disinformation plant because we know that this data is out there. That's why I still have phones around that you can remove the battery. That's why. Um, if you read the Snowden things, uh, there was a... There's a tool that you can put on an Apple to disable the power button. So when you turn, hit the off, the off screen goes off 
looks like it goes off, but the phone actually stays on. Um, so it, it's a tool. It's one of the tools. So you can't ever turn the app. Really, if somebody's after you, you can't turn the Apple off. It's always on, which the geo is always on. The mic is always on. Um, the only defense you have, um, if you want to defend yourself, get one of these. Uh, this is a um, this is a old style plug and a phone that'll accept the old style plug. So you get one of these cords um, and you cut the cord really close to the plug and now you got a dead barrel. And when you slide the dead barrel into the phone, it opens up the switch inside the phone and nerding the mic. The only thing that you can do if you're on the attacker side is you have to turn on the, um, the speaker phone. But then you got a risk because now the thing is really loud. <laughs> so if anything is on the other side, the person can hear it. Um, yeah, I've seen hacks about um, disabling the camera via software, but via a software hack so that the camera can no longer be recording you where it just is like looping around and it can no longer be spying on you. I mean, because the problem in the article that, is, that was discussed is that, you know, let's say you didn't use one of these pieces of salt, this stalkerware, and you did install it on your wife or your child's phone. There's vulnerabilities in the stalkerware, in the stalkerware software themselves. So now third-party attackers or hackers or people or cyber espionage people or threat actors, whoever they are, now they can be watching your child and your wife too. So, because they're spilling records. They're spilling the records of all the people that they're monitoring. Right. It's like an intelligent agency that has open records for all the people they're monitoring. That's what, the, that's what these software companies are doing. You're entrusting this third party software to, to, you know, to spy on your wife, but now the whole internet can see her, you know, it, is that really what you want? And so it's, People are, uh, and, and what about the victims of these people? What about the wife? She has no idea she's being monitored and now she has no idea that threat actors from all over the world can just connect up and go to a specific URL and see all of her phone records. Right, right. I mean, it, it, these things, and, and the pieces, the originating, what started all this was there was a guy that was selling um, stalkerware, and that's where this even got coined, I think, was by him because that was the name of the software. He got busted by um, the U.S. Um, the U.S. FBI and went to jail, and they took his software, but the software, I think, got leaked at one point, <laughs> and... <laughs> And that's where some of this stuff is coming from. Um, and that software is wicked old. It's not even current stuff. Yeah. So, I, you know, it, it, the whole thing is this. Two-factor is a joke. It's not going to work. It's too many people, too many hands have it, have access to the history whether or not you, when you send out a code, I've already found a couple of the websites that send me codes to log in for two-factor. Old codes work because I tried them with my own account. Oh, great. Yeah, and I actually did it by mistake because I typed it, hand type, you got to hand type it in the browser. I looked at the wrong message, typed the wrong code, and bang, it worked. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the security theater, yeah. as Bruce, as Bruce Schneier likes to say. Who's that? He's the inventor of Blowfish. Oh, okay. The fabric, uh, algorithm that you like? Yeah. yeah. He's a security enthusiast, author. Cool. I didn't he invented know. the term security theater, I think. <laughs> it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. Well, up next, 
we are going to talk about ethical AI. Yeah. <laughs> like there is such a thing. Okay, tech, techcrunch.com did a story by Connie Lozios called Credo AI launches backed by 5.5 million to help companies with ethical AI. And the uh, inventor of this, or the founder of this company, Navira Singh, uh, she formerly worked for Qualcomm, Microsoft, and um, she, you know, discussed in her article when she quoted with the verb um, that she helped develop a Twitter bot in 2016. And then pretty soon after that, within a day, the Twitter bot became racist. And then she talked about some other AI, which was being used in the medical industry. And it would badly misjudge the health needs of the sickest black patients. And then other AI was also found credit scoring AI systems they found to repeatedly be sexist. So, Trip, what do you think about these AIs and their qualities? I know what I think. I think that these AI systems are built by people and the builders of these people sometimes have their own judgments and viewpoints and that just gets built right into the AI sure. or maybe the AI develops itself or it's learning from us and it learns our racism and it learns our sexism. What do you think, Tripp? I think that preference has some things. Oh, I could feel that coming when you were talking. <laughs> and oh, I could... no. Are you trying to hold it in? Yeah. So um, what I'll do is I'll flip it over to me and cut that part out. <laughs> Great segue. Uh, <laughs> so ethical AI, I've already seen unethical AI uh, on Twitter. I experienced a group that was hunting people, uh, literally putting out tweets to <gasps> hunt for individuals to, um, to uh, basically what they were doing was they were setting people up to be investigated by um, one of the federal agencies. So, and that was with extreme political bias. There was a company that was a uh, recorded future that was also involved in uh, research on the same company. I kind of put some things together to figure out that um, it was the same company which had in interjected itself through using AI in the Brexit movement and also into the election of German Chancellor Merkel, uh, I think the last time, second to last time she was elected to office. So with politics, AI is always going to have a preference which is not ethical at all because preference isn't... Um, Preference doesn't have anything to do with ethics. And that's, that's really where the difference between behavior has to do because when we're talking about our own ethics, we do it in a way or we frame it in a way so that we tend to be with non-preferential. And that's part of what these movements are in our current society. But these con the con they're being convoluted because they're extreme bias um, and stating the, op the total opposite that they're not with bias. 
and um, this has to do with that um, that crazy naming uh, stuff um, and the uh, equality stuff. When you have extreme bias, um, you can't be unethical if, or with ethic because ethic is non-biased. At least that's the way I look at it. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, preference can be unethical because if you look at the credit scoring AI system that's sexist, well, I mean, if you were the owner of some firm, you had some credit scoring AI and you asked the AI to, you know, choose the mortgages for the, for the best candidates, well, then maybe they're all going to choose men who make more money instead of women. Okay. So while it would be preferential for the company to try and make the most profits, it, the, the AI would only be picking men and the people with the top salaries. And they tend to be men versus women who get paid less. So there is ethics that need to be built into these things to equal out disparities that the AI may find it's true. Yes, men might be more better, you know, we, you might want to have the most profits and only have men, but, but that's not a fair world. So the software company that this woman uh, decided to develop, what it tries to do is it tries to lay a framework and a set of guidelines. And she hopes someday to become the standard for ethical AI and have others, you know, set benchmarks where they come in and they assess what the AI is doing and have different models that work for different companies and can, um, can try and set some standards to level the playing field when you have to deal with, with AI. I think it's very hard. And I think that the more AI creeps into our lives and in, into decision-making such as healthcare services or credit scoring, the, the more you're going to find problems with it and the, and unfair situations. Well, we're seeing unfair situations right now with the yeah. AI on social media. AI yeah. is running social media and you know, the social the big social media players like the people at Facebook and the people at Twitter specifically, they don't recognize or they don't publicize that the AI is actually in control of the platform because it does really weird shit. I, excuse me, but I mean, that thing where uh, on Twitter where it just dumps people uh, out of um, a the great purge in January, I don't think that humans necessarily knew that the AI was going to do that. I think politically inside the company, they had um, they somebody had heart failure the next day because basically what happened is thirty million people got pushed off of Twitter overnight, um, and it's doing it now. Um, it's sweeping through. I have gr a, a group on Twitter, and I lost like 40 people last week so it, and their accounts don't exist anymore and it's like it's not like it's a bot it's somebody i was talking to so uh, you know they violate the rules and they do stuff and the platforms target them but the platform kind of targets them look at us with the covid thing and we got to watch what we say because this will be on YouTube um, because you can't say that word all the way through. Um, uh, we posted that on Facebook and it got ejected. Yeah, our whole thing got marked as spam and uh, just because of our clickbait. I don't of think our it... eye candy trying to get you guys to click the videos. <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with the, the it had the word. In, the thing is, it had the word and it read the word. So then um, what we're talking about is the virus that's running around. Um, 
and we got to watch the word virus too when we talk about computers because the AI on um, Google and uh, YouTube doesn't know the difference between um, a human pathon and a computer pathon. So we got to be careful when we mention those on here because it'll flag us. I know Twitter flags me for um, putting that word in, that word when I'm talking about programs. It's considered a negative word <laughs> to the AI. By the way, all AIs are not the same. <laughs> no. Well, I'm Honey. I'm Trip. You have a great afternoon. That worked. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that, that was